Part 3, Converging Trajectories, 29 to 57 AR. Chapter 17, Mishra's Workshop. The Imperial Court had changed while Ashnod had been away, which is no surprise to the apprentice. In the years since the fall of Krug, she had left and returned a half dozen times, and upon each return she discovered some new wing or pit or chamber had been added to the court of the new Kadir, the Falaji. Mishra had selected a site on the northwest tip of the Kerr Ridges with a dominating view of the arid lands to the west. Through a trick of the weather patterns, this area was well watered and was swathed in trees so large that they might have been planted by the Thran themselves. They were some type of oak with thick, heavy trunks and long, horizontal branches. Already some of the quarters and laboratories were being nestled among those branches. When Mishra became Kadir, Ashnod reflected. He wished to set down his roots, perhaps among the great trees. This was what he meant, literally. The first time she had seen the site, she had trouble believing that such huge growths had blossomed in a land that was elsewhere bone-dry and arid. Surrounding the grove of great trees, most of the smaller timbers, still great, towering oaks and younger maples, downslopes had been cleared. Part of the clearing was for cultivation, but more of it was for smaller foundries and forges. Already the residue of those forges spilled slag, the unusable remains of their industry, down the slopes and into the streams at the foot of the hills. The latest addition was a great barn that dominated an area at one end of the encampment. It was constructed of half hoops of metal with fabric stretched between them. Already slave laborers were laying stonework for permanent walls along the base. Ashnod let a slave stable hand take her horse and entered the workshop proper. One of the great trees had died eons ago, leaving a massive stump over 60 feet high and twice that in diameter. Mishra had the stump hollowed out and converted into his own private workshop to rival the crush orniary in now dead Krug. Now that workshop towered above her, the windows carved through its outer bark lit by fires within. The windows were oddly shaped, formed more by the twists of the once living bark than by Mishra's own needs. To Ashnod, the windows looked like malignant winking eyes. The rooms within were similar odd, strange shapes that resembled teardrops or spirals or multi-planed solids. Rooms rose slightly from one end to the other or were constructed of numerous terraces, each with different machinery. Ashnod had no doubt that there were additional rooms within the structure that had not been there when she had last been present. Such was the sprawling nature of the new Kadir's domains. One thing had not changed was the treasure piled in the hallways, the remains of the initial looting of Krug. There was gold platterware and cracked crystal, gems spilling out of wooden boxes split by rough handling, and rare vases of blue and white glazing with longitudinal cracks running from rim to base. All of it was gathered to celebrate the power of the Raki of the Suardi, their new Kadir by acclamation of the Falaji Empire, the mighty Mishra. One wall had been cleared to allow diplomats, supplicants, courtiers, and other parasites to wait at Mishra's whim. Ashnod did not have to wait, of course, and breezed past these poor wretches. She felt the pressure of their eyes as she passed and smiled. That was one of the good things about returning to Mishra's workshop. The workshop proper was two parts library, two parts workshop, and two parts throne room. A great dark oak throne had been pushed against one wall, piled high with pillows and resting on a carpet of pure regal purple, pulled from the wreckage of the Palace of Krug. The throne was flanked on both sides by piles of books. There were huge books looted from Yosha and shipped from Zigand and Tomakul, huge folios and small personal diaries, scrolls and tablets and all manners of journals bound in leather of beasts, both common and forgotten. Ashnod noted, not for the first time, that many of the volumes had gathered a thin patent of dust and had not been disturbed since their initial placement. Ashnod thought of Urza's orniary. Even cleaned and organized for their visit, it had a cluttered look. But it was a busy clutter, an organized chaos, one that was continually in motion, continually evolving. The books in Mishra's workshop might as well be blank for the amount of use they saw. Mishra was not on his throne. While the others cooled their heels outside, he was at a great slate board, another prize of the war that had been hung along one curved wall. Mishra had been working in multicolored chalk, and out of the rainbow smears of his writings and frequent erasures, there arose the portrait of a dragon engine's head, bedecked with arcane letters and illegible, illegible scribbles. Hajar, ever-faithful Hajar, stood by the throne and announced Ashnod's presence, which was fortunate, 
for Ashnod felt that Mishra would not bother to look up otherwise. Mishra regarded Ashnod, and the apprentice could sense a tenseness, a coiled spring nervousness in the master. He tapped the chalk against the slate a few more times, then tossed the chalk into the box and padded toward his throne. Report! He grunted as he retook his place among the pillows. With each of her visits, Mishra had become more brusque with her, more abrupt with her, elevated to the supreme position with the added responsibilities of running the far-flung empire. He had no longer any time to be polite, even if he had the inclination. Plunder from the ocean provinces, said Ashnod, proffering an inventory list that Hajar took. She folded her hands before her for a dry resuscitation. 4,000 pounds of gold, 6,000 in silver, including 2,000 bullion, 17 vases in good condition filled with gemstones worth. Mishra waved away Ashnod's word and said, Books! Ashnod sighed. Master Mishra had become more impatient of late. Five new volumes on alchemy not in your collection, three volumes on optics, two on hydraulics that may be of vital interest, and one volume on metalgy in the ocean style, which may prove invaluable, one on clocks, which sings the praises of its author regarding... Records of gem cutting, tin smithing, and architecture, the standard collection of journals and diaries that will have to be read to determine if they contain anything useful, a large number of maps, most of Corlesian trading routes. Mishra nodded, folded his hands before him, and patted his fingers together. Usable resources. Three new mines have been seized, bringing the total to 17, said Ashnod. There were 18, but Yoshin rebels pulled the main support frames out from one, choosing to seal themselves inside rather than surrender. Four foundries have been dismantled and are being relocated here, and they should be operational within two months. Smaller forges are being set up in the Suwardi marches. Lumbering continues in northern Yosha, but under armed protection. Mishra nodded again and said, News. More of the same, said Ashnod. The surviving Yoshin towns along the coast are willing to pay tribute and swear fealty, at least on the surface. However, raids and rebellions are common from the Suwardi marches south. As a result, any timetable involving... Yoshin resources is questionable at best. There is no shortage of slaves from among the captured revolutionaries and fallen towns. Ashnod was gliding the truth at best. For the first time, the Falaji were controlling a population not of Falaji blood, and with it the traditional ties to the Kadir. A more heavily armed presence was needed in Yosha to control the people and guard the plunder. That tied down manpower, and the Falaji hated to be tied down. Mishra did not pursue the nature of the unrest in his new conquests. Instead, he simply said, And my brother. Still beyond the Kerr ridges, said Ashnod. The report always devolved down to the simple question, Ashnod's simple response. The plunder, the resources, the knowledge were all secondary to the activities of Mishra's brother. As far as you know, said Mishra. Ashnod sighed, trying to hide her impatience. Since taking the mantle of command, Mishra had changed, and not for the better. As far as we currently know, ornithopters have been sighted along the major passes eastward, but there have been no organized Yoshin resistance. Urza is said to have established an encampment in Argiv, near the Corliss border, but Corliss swears neutrality in the matter in exchange for access to Falaji markets. Hajar made a huffing noise. Most of the Falaji considered the Corlesians as bad as the Yoshins, spreading honey lies, friendship while driving the hardest of bargains. Were the Corliss merchants truly interested in pleasing the Falaji, they would have captured Urza and turned him over to when Mishra's brother had crossed into their territory. What is he waiting for? said Mishra, patting his fingers together. It's been a year. The loss of Krug and most of northern Yosha has struck him hard, said Ashnod. He may simply be in hiding. He never hides, said Mishra hotly. He plots. He plans. He's still in communication with the Yoshin towns. I'm sure of it. And the rebels act on his command. He's waiting for the right moment, for the moment of weakness, of inattentiveness, and then... Mishra raised both hands to indicate the magnitude of his brother's imagined revenge. Ashnod bit her lip, then said, If that is the case, perhaps we should lay siege to the Ramesian Yoshin towns and plunder them as well, denying him any further resources? Our dragon engines have been quiet for surprisingly long. Mishra made a grunting noise and slid off his throne. He motioned for Ashnod to follow as he headed for a side door to his throne room. Ashnod followed, and the rear of the procession was brought up by Hajar. The side door led to a spiral stairway that corkscrewed through the once-living wood of the workshop. That, in turn, led to a postern gate alongside a massive stump. Mishra walked through the new barn, a curious Ashnod and impressive Hajar in tow. A few of the slaves building the walls paused to watch them pass and earned a beating from the slave masters for the infantry. The interior of the new building was a single room dominated by two great machines. 
Small figures, scholars sent by Zigon and Tamakul, and students from among the brightest of Falaji climbed over the machines like ants over a carcass. The first of the machines looked very much like a carcass. It was one of the dragon engines laying on its side. Its lower treads had been removed, and the plates along its belly had been pried loose to reveal the network of cables beneath. These had been uncoiled like entrails to reveal pumps and servos within the heart of the beast. Several small gems glittered weakly within the great wounds of the creation, and for the most part, it was an inert thing, a dead creature. Alongside it was a second dragon engine, which resembled the first as a child's drawing of a horse resembles the real creature. It was all hammered angles and sharp edges and lacked the graceful, fluid styling of the partially dismantled creature beside it. Its face was similar, but frozen in a parody of the original dragon engine. Its muscles were not fluid cables, but roughly honed slabs of metal held together by rivets and welds. The second dragon engine was under construction, and as Ashton watched, the scholars and students managed to get it to raise a foreleg. It was functional, but looked less a living thing than a damaged beast next to it. It was injured in Krug, said Mishra, regarding the fallen dragon engine, his face almost pained by the sight. Against one of my brother's cursed avengers. It survived the battle, but one by one its systems began to fail. It faltered. It was paralyzed along one side, and then it went blind. There was nothing for it but slowly monitor its decay. None beyond this encampment know this. Ashnod shrugged. You have the other dragon engines. And the same may happen to them, said Mishra hotly. I don't know what tricks my brother has planned, and with each day he may have more of them. Can you imagine what would happen if one of these engines collapsed on the battlefield? What if the enemy saw that my creations were defeatable? Ashnod thought about it, then nodded slowly. And my brother is capable of defeating them. This I know, said Mishra. If only I'd remained alongside it. But no, instead I chose to take an engine in a fruitless pursuit of one of Urza's ornithopters, thinking it held possible hostages. A small error on my part, but a fatal one for this engine. If I had remained in Krug, this would still be functional. If you had remained in Krug, thought Ashnod, you'd likely not be Kadir now. But Mishra knew nothing of that nor of her involvement with Taunos and the Queen. She only nodded. Mishra waved at the other construct, and this is but a shadow, a puppet crafted to resemble the original. It has most of the power and none of the grace of the original, none of the sentience, none of the life. There are secrets locked within the dying body, terrible secrets that are beyond our power to duplicate. Perhaps Urza, Mishra's voice trailed off, then returned with iron behind the tone, Urza could, which is why we must be ready these new engines, new devices to keep them at bay. Ashnod said, Master Misha, I think I can help. Mishra turned to her. You can rebuild the dying engine? Ashnod looked at the carcass of the original dragon engine. It looked like a carrion picked apart by beetles. She shook her head. Your own plans proceed apace. Allow me to return to my own studies, and I can give you weapons to defeat your brother. I need you to oversee the plundering of Yosha, said Mishra. Only you know what is valuable and what is dross. Ashnod shook her head. Much of what is valuable from Yosha has already been taken, or can be demanded as tribute, or has been pirated away to Corliss. You don't need me to scavenge, my lord. You need me to think, to help build. Mishra thought a moment, and Ashnod continued. I have had time to think of matters, both in my forced rest as a guest of Krug, and later, seeking books of information for you. I believe that I can wrap a machine around a spark of life. I believe I can merge the living and unliving together. I can give you the army to defeat Urza. Mishra rocked slightly back and forth and shook his head. I need you to be my eyes, my ears be on these walls. There's much I need to have done, and so few, like you and Hajar here, who I trust to do it. Ashnod tilted her head to one side and said, A pity Urza would trust Thanos with such a matter. Indeed, it was Thanos, the student who distracted you with the fleeing ornithopter, for Urza the master had trained him well. Are you saying that Urza is a better master than you are? A red storm of rage formed on Mishra's face, and for a moment, Ashton wondered if she had pressed too far. But Mishra took a deep breath, and the anger subsided slightly. Sharply, he said, What do you need to produce such an army? Ashton kept her gaze level, as if she had anticipated this request. My own lab, away from prying eyes, she nodded in mock reverence to Hajar. Most of the books on biology and anatomy from the plundered libraries, a portion of the resources sent as tribute, surgical tools from Zegon, and slaves, both skilled ones, smiths and glass blowers, and ones that no one will care if they are lost. Mishra was silent for a moment. What criminals do, he said. 
Ashnod nodded sternly. Criminals, traitors, revolutionaries, deserters, those who disappearance will not be mourned. What I'm thinking would be distasteful to some. She nodded at Hajar again. But necessary for us to build an army to defeat your brother. That is one reason I would want to keep the encampment a secret. Mistra paused for a moment, then said, Do it. I cannot promise results today, said Ashnod quickly, or tomorrow or the next. But with my research and your rebuilt dragon engines, we can hunt down your brother and destroy him, wherever he hides. My brother does not, Mishra stopped, then nodded. Take what you need, send me reports. I want to know what you're doing, and make it quick. My brother will not lay waiting for his chance forever. Ashnod added, You should know what I propose to do. It is not a gentle process. Mishra said, These are not gentle times, and we are not gentle people. Do what you must, but give me the weapons that I need. Do what you must. Ashnod bowed low, and Mishra spun on his heels retreating back up the hillside to his warped workshop. Hajar, his silent ghost, followed in his wake. After they returned to closed doors, Ashnod thought. The Falaji assistant would counsel his Kadir against trusting the scarlet-haired woman, or he would commend the Kadir on his wisdom and be relieved that the woman would no longer be a regular participant in Mishra's court. It mattered not to Ashnod. She waited until both figures were out of sight, then she allowed a sm slow smile to spread across her face. She had gotten what she wanted, her own shop, and the freedom to pursue her own studies. And she learned something else. Whatever else Mishra was, he was afraid. Afraid of his brother. Afraid of being punished for stealing his brother's woman, for destroying his brother's house, for breaking his brother's toys. It was a useful tool to use in dealing with the new Kadir, but one she had to be careful not to be blunt with over use. Speak the magic word and the gates to the treasure swing open, she said to herself thinking of an old Falaji legend, and the secret word is Urza. She watched the ants scuttle over the two dragon engine carcasses, stripping one to provide life for the other. Then she returned to her own quarters to finalize her plans for the future.